Thank you, Ellen. I have to admit that it's one of the more unique in introductions I've ever experienced. And in answer to your final question, only Karen knows for sure. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. This afternoon, I'd like to share with you a remarkable story. It's a story that begins in 1956 at the start of the rolling cauldron that was to be known as the Cold War. It was my good fortune to play a role in the final chapter of this story, though not, I can assure you, due to any calculated actions on my part. As is so often the case when history comes calling, I was at the right place at the right time. I'll be begin with this very innocuous looking letter. The letterhead reads, the architect of the Capitol, Washington, DC. The date is March 28th, 1956. And the addressee is Mr. Walter J. Tui, the president of the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway Company. The letter reads, dear Mr. Tui, this is to introduce Mr. J. George Stewart, architect of the Capitol, who is calling upon you on matters of vital importance to the Congress of the United States. We, the undersigned, representing the leadership of the Congress of the United States, will appreciate any cooperation you may give us. Sincerely yours and signed in their own hand, Sam Rayburn, Speaker of the House of Representatives, Lyndon Johnson, Majority Leader of the Senate, Joseph W. Martin, Minority Leader of the House of Representatives, and William Nolan, Minority Leader of the Senate. Thus began an adventure that would continue for nearly four decades. But let's not move ahead too quickly to get the complete picture of what prompted the letter and to what the letter refers, we need to step back a few years to the 1950s, the early 1950s. Memories of World War II were raw and fresh. It was becoming increasingly clear that the Soviets were not the allies that they once appeared to be. They had in fact exploded their own nuclear bomb in 1953. A short time later, they had successfully tested an intercontinental, ballista, intercontinental ballistic missile that could carry that device literally from sea to shining sea. These events delivered a message that Washington received loud and clear. Not only did the Soviet Union have the bomb, they had the power to bury it in the rose garden of the White House. Now, in the early 50s, most people in the US thought of nuclear war in the abstract, as in duck and cover and public service announcements that some of us even experienced in grade school and in backyard bomb shelters that were being built by many families. However, there were more than a few people in Washington, D.C. for whom global thermal nuclear war was not an abstract concept at all. It was imminent. It was only a matter of when and where it would occur. President Eisenhower, to his everlasting credit, recognized the need to consider the unconsiderable and to prepare for the unpreparable what would occur after a nuclear exchange with the Soviets? What would happen to the US government? How would the rebuilding process begin? There would be millions of US citizens that would survive nuclear war. Who was going to lead them? Eisenhower reasoned that a nuclear exchange with the Soviets, though a global catastrophe of unimaginable proportions need not be an end to government per se. There must be a way for the three branches of government, the executive, legislative, and judicial, to survive themselves, reconstitute as func a functioning entity, and provide leadership in rebuilding America. Towards that end, 
Eisenhower directed the Office of Defense Mobilization in 1955 <clears throat> to construct a series of top secret emergency relocation sites outside of, but close enough to Washington, DC, outside to avoid collateral, avoid collateral damage close enough so that they could be actually reached. Towards that end, the sites would serve as bunkers where the three branches of government, top military officers and their staffs would hole up during an attack and direct a counterattack. <clears throat> but most importantly, a functioning government for our 175 year old democracy at the time would survive. The relocation, relocation sites were known collectively as the doomsday bunkers. <clears throat> the bunker for the president, Supreme Court justices and the cabinet secretaries and their staff was a self-contained community deep within the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. 50 miles northwest of Washington, DC, it was called Mount Weather. Another bunker, Site R, would be the home away from home for all Pentagon officers and other key military personnel. Located six miles from Camp David along the Maryland-Pennsylvania border and blasted into the dense green stone of Raven Rock Mountain, <clears throat> Site R was the home <clears throat> to the both, both the Alternative Joint Communication Center and the Alternative National Military Command Center. And there you have it. Doomsday bunkers for the government, Pentagon brass and their staffs, continuity and democracy guaranteed. Or was it? Let's review those bunkers. The executive and judicial branches would relocate to Mount Weather. The military to Site R was something missing. Indeed, something was missing. As, in, as of 1956, the legislative branch of the US government, one of the three foundations of our tripartite system of checks and balances was, as we would say, bunkerless. Eisenhower had pushed Congress for years to begin construction of a relocation facility of their own. Believe it or not, it was the leadership in the Congress who were the ones who were stalling. And we would ask ourselves, why? As astonishing as this may sound, <clears throat> more than a few people have confirmed that there were those in the House and the Senate <clears throat> during the early 1950s, who believed if a nuclear war occurred, the only way to run the country would be to suspend all federal and constitutional rights. The suspension of those individual rights would obviously be more difficult if Congress survived in intact as a functioning unit. In 1956, Eisenhower had had enough of the congressional stalling. And the need for the facility had reached, reached a crisis point. He called the joint congressional leadership to the Oval Office and argued forcefully that after a nuclear con conflict, the survival of the executive and judicial branches would be meaningless at best, possibly even dangerous without a functioning US Congress. The, the congressional leadership had a duty, I admonished them, an obligation to the American people to survive and reconstitute itself. Fortunately, Eisenhower carried the day. After a few cloakroom discussions between him and LBJ. Before the bipartisan leaders left the Oval Office that day, this letter would be signed by <clears throat> all the leaders in the room. However, the question as to whether this could be done in the normal legislative process was highly questionable. 
the voices that, would, that had been speaking out already would obviously fight the whole program. So together with the president, congressional leaders Sam Rayburn, Lyndon Johnson, Joe Martin, and William Nolan made a unilateral decision to covertly authorize the Office of Defense Mobilization to find a few suitable site for the legislative relocation facility. <clears throat> the US Congress would finally have its bunker, albeit with the knowledge of just two members of the House and two members of the Senate. <clears throat> Interesting to note, for the next 40 years, those four leaders, plus the vice president, as president of the Senate, would be the only members of Congress ever cleared and briefed on this top secret project, codenamed at the time, Project X. It would later become Project Congo, then Project Casper, finally, Project Greek Island. In March of 1956, the decision was made on the site <clears throat> for the legislative relocation facility. Secrecy was crucial. And what was the choice for the doomsday bunker that would assure the, tri the tripartite system of checks and balances so essential um, to the world's oldest governing democracy? What was the choice to be the guarantor of the essential obligations and services to all 50 states and the American people. In short, it was a resort. But not just any resort. The Office of Defense Mobilization selected one of the oldest, grandest, and most exclusive resorts in the world. This most unlikely of Cold War soldiers was the Greenbrier. In 1956, I'd like to note that the Greenbrier was owned by the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway Company, president of the parent company um, was the gentleman who, to whom uh, J. George Stewart delivered the letter requesting assistance. It's also interesting to note that in the mid fifties, CSX Corporation, the railroad, was in deep financial trouble, just like many of the railroads of the day. It's also interesting to note that Dr. Milton Eisenhower, president of Johns Hopkins University and brother of the president, shown here as he is given advice and dispatched to South America as special envoy to South America, Dr. Eisenhower was on the board of CSX Corporation and a major shareholder. It doesn't take a genius to add two plus two, would I be correct? The construction fees and government subsidies for a project of this size and duration would be of tremendous long-term value to a company in financial trouble. Now, oh, in fairness, I should also note that there are other compelling reasons for selecting the Greenbrier as the legislative bunker. There were numerous logistical and infrastructure advantages. One of the most fascinating, however, was geological advantages. The resort happens to lie in a lovely valley, the Greenbrier Valley, nestled between two small mountain ranges. The proximity of those ranges and their height create what is known in the weather world as inversion. In plain English, inversion would keep any nuclear fallout from ever entering the Greenbrier Valley unless there was a direct hit in the valley. Hence the necessity of secrecy. Now to maintain the chronology of my story, <clears throat> let's turn again to that letter I read earlier. The letter was the congressional leadership's opening gambit, if you will. They needed to gauge whether or not CSX would be interested in putting one of their premier assets into play on the Cold War chessboard. Cutting to the chase, CSX was interested, you bet they were. They were interested in the proposition for two reasons. First, patriotism was still in vogue in the 1950s. The words duty, honor, and country meant something. 
40 years ago when the government said, we need your help, not one man in a thousand would turn his back. Second, and I suspect this played no small part in CSX's ultimate decision, the president's brother was turning blue every time he reviewed this, the corporate stock performance. This would be a guaranteed revenue stream. I can only imagine the tremble in Mr. Tui's hands as he read this letter and thought to himself, possibly, possibly, I can control the 800 pound gorilla and that can save my railroad while at the same time answering the call of my country. Thus began a series of conversations <clears throat> between the government, CSX and the Green Bar, all under the general topic of how in the hell are we gonna pull this thing off? The answer, they would hide the legislative relocation facility in plain sight. Of course it would work. All hotels grow, expand, and remodel. At the same time that the Greenbrier's new West Virginia wing, the superstructure, uh, was constructed above ground, Dr. Strangelove and his crew would be preparing for World War III, 70 feet below ground, and building the substructure, as it would be termed in all documentation. In 1959, construction begins on the Greenbrier's West Virginia wing and below it, the legislative relocation facility. The facility became fully operational in September of 1962, just in time for the Cuban Missile Crisis. As the interior of the bunker was completed and covered with dirt, work turned to the interior. The questions and suspicions from subcontractors just never seemed to stop. One contractor asked, what is the purpose of the cavernous room in which we are working today? And he was given the typical response that was practiced by most. It's an exhibit hall for the conventioneers that will be coming to the Greenbrier. This is an exhibit hall, he asked incredulously. We just installed 110 urinals. Just what in the hell are you gonna be exhibiting? <laughs> he had a point, don't you think? In spite of the rumors and speculation, re remarkably one of the great secrets of the Cold War remained safe and secure in the little town of White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. Oh, and what a secret it was. For what no one knew, what no one could have even suspected was that beneath that new wing, the West Virginia wing, of the Greenbrier was an impregnable fortress of massive proportions, all hidden in plain sight. And what lay beyond the bunker's reinforced blast doors was even more surreal. That's 26 tons of Mosler safe blast door. One person could open or close it. Great engineering. Behind that blast door, the surrealism began with 112,000 square feet. Think of two football fields stacked on top of each other. It would contain everything for the 535 members of the US House and Senate and their staffs, whatever they would need to run the country that had just been dev devastated, decimated by global thermal nuclear war. Communications equipment, including a TV and radio studio, meeting rooms, bunk beds, an ICU, a 20 bed clinic, medical labs, soap, towels, shaving kits, drinking glasses, plates, silverware, pharmaceuticals, air and water purifiers, a crematorium, and two gavels. Oh, and 110 urinals. Now, once the bunker was built, the question was who was going to maintain it? 
most maintenance um, would be covered by the green bar staff, either through the engineering staff or other labor employees, labor employees. However, the bunker also contains state-of-the-art electronics and sophisticated communications and chemical, biological, and radiological air purifying equipment. Clearly, the investment wasn't going to be maintained by the housekeepers of the Greenbrier. And they couldn't just bring in anyone to maintain cryptographic apparatus. These people needed to have military backgrounds with top secret clearance in a very specialized arcane discipline. But how do you bring in these people without bringing in unwanted, perhaps even fatal attention? Again, the answer was quite simple. You hide them in, in plain sight. In 1962, a company named Fourth Scythe Associates, headed by Fritz Bugis, this gentleman, actually the project director, um, took up residence in Greenbrier County. There were 14 employees. The company's employees told everyone in White Silver Springs that their job was to service and repair TVs for the Greenbrier and to provide audio visual services um, for the Greenbrier's conference customers. Now in reality, Forsyth Associates was a front created by the Office of Defense Mobilization to support and maintain the legislative relocation facility. And maybe JP over here is one of those guys too. JP? I thought so. My own part in this drama begins in 1980. In 1979, as Ellen said, I was general manager here at the DeSoto Hilton. I'd been with Hilton for 14 years and was looking for a new challenge. One day I read that the position of general manager and director of operations at the Green Bar had just opened. I thought that was unbelievable. I'd never worked in a resort, but for 20 years, anyone who knew me knew that my fantasy career was to be president of the Green Bar. GM would be close enough. I applied for the position, and in 1980, after several interviews and some rather, rather fevered importuning to the Almighty, the president of the Green Bar called me and offered me the job. I was one happy man, exhilarated beyond words. I resigned my position from Hilton and looked to the future with an almost giddy sense of anticipation and confidence. We had no clue what was literally beneath our feet every day as we arrived. I would soon find out what was below our feet. Now, being dutiful in analyzing operating costs, particularly payroll, our most controllable cost, I began some initial reviews of departmental staffing. What I found was breathtaking. The Greenbrier was the most labor-intensive resort or hotel that I had ever experienced, 2,200 employees. In particular, the hotel had an engineering department with 110 skilled technicians. I thought to myself, for a hotel? I've been around hotels three times this side, the Conrad Hilton in Chicago. They had half the number of engineers. Something was very wrong. I began my investigation by checking into the payroll records day by day versus the body count in the various working uh, positions throughout the property. Doing the head count, the results were ominous. On any given day, there were 20 to 60 employees that were missing. They were all in engineering. There were other routine issues of great concern. I would get purchase orders across my desk for signature on a regular basis. But one day came a purchase order for 10,000 gallons of diesel fuel. I called our engineering department and I asked how many diesel driven vehicles of any kind we had. A little bit of stuttering on the other end of the line. I was told we had a Volvo compactor garbage truck and that was it. 
maybe a few assorted lawnmowers, more stuttering. And I'm thinking, 10,000 gallons of diesel fuel. My next question was, how many tanks do we have on the property that can hold 10,000 gallons of anything? And the answer was none. I was quickly coming to one inescapable conclusion. Someone was running a construction company and the green bra was the phantom payroll for that company. I was absolutely convinced that someone was cooking the books and I was gonna be the one who was blamed for it. My mind's eye saw me spending the rest of my life in the big house with a six foot, 10 inch, 400 pound cellmate who calls me Lucille. <laughs> I stormed into the president's office, explained everything I had discovered. His response, very calm, was, Ted, there are a few things about the Green Bear we're not ready to reveal to you. I pressed him further because I was ready to leave. He said, oh, for God's sakes, Hold off, just give me 24 hours. Now, against my better judgment, I decided to wait 24 hours before I resigned. The next morning, I was met at the front door of the Green Bar by two gentlemen who pulled up in a black sedan and told me to get in. <laughs> I was taken to a building near the Green Bar stables I would later find out that this was our secure room, our skiff, a sensitive compartmented information facility. And I was told of the Greenbrier's incredible secret. I was also told I was now a member of the club as they would term it. That would be the handful of people, of people cleared at the top secret need to know level and I was briefed in my responsibilities under an active lease, the operating plan for activation, the client we would serve, and the code name of the legislative relocation facility. In 1980, it was Project Casper. Between 1984 and 87, I left the Green Bar to become managing director of a resort in Bermuda. And in 1987, CSX asked me to return to the Greenbrier as President Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of CSX Hotels. My dream had come true beyond my uh, young dreams and anticipated uh, successes. Now fast forward to uh, January of 1992. Allow me to introduce you to an enterprising young reporter from the Washington Post by the name of Ted Gupp. A name that will live in infamy for many, certainly for me. On that notorious day, Gupp called me up and said he was a travel writer with the Post. He wanted to interview me. <clears throat> As we did with all members of the press who came to the Greenbrier, I had him checked out. <clears throat> we had a unique ability to check anyone out and getting in-depth background was not a problem. The report came back and the results confirmed all my suspicions. Gupp was not a travel writer. He was an investigative reporter. He was a lawyer by profession. He was a professor of journalism at Georgetown. He had been on the staff of Newsweek in 60 Minutes and had recently written an article in Time Magazine exposing Mount Weather, the doomsday bunker that we discussed earlier for the executive and judicial branches of government. Now he had found the legislative bunker. Deep in the pit of my stomach, uh, so deep I wouldn't even acknowledge the possibility I knew our cover had been blown. The Washington Post was on the story. Someone who could smell the celebrity of Woodward and Bernstein was also on that story. Crack cocaine could not be more addictive. It was over. It was going to come out. It was only a question of when. 
the day of our interview arrived and Gup walked into my office and to his credit, <clears throat> he immediately admitted who he was and the story he was pursuing. As it was, he asked many incisive and leading questions and carefully evaded, I carefully evaded and disavowed every single one of them as I was required to do by the oath I took and signed the day I was briefed in 1980. I towed the party line. I didn't want to end up, at, end up in Fort Leavenworth. Unfortunately, Gupp had the information, he had the data. His questions were so pointed, so on the money, that I knew that someone who had been briefed in the top secret compartments of Project Greek Island had betrayed it. Halfway through our dance of thrust and parry, Gupp pulled out a rough diagram of the bunker that had been sketched out on the piece of yellow legal pad paper. The sketch nailed the bunker's interior. I was right. It was over, and Gupp's story broke on May 31st, 1992. It was in the Washington Post magazine. It was the cover story and 10 pages inside. The story caused a sensation. The Green Bar was in the national news for weeks. Every major newspaper in the US ran an article. There was it was the top story in all the network and cable news shows. And it was an exclusive 30 minute TV un unveiling on NBC Dateline with Stone Phillips. It was even fodder for Jay Leno and David Letterman. And almost as quickly as it began, it was over. The story ran its course, life went on, the earth continu continued in its orbit the sun rose in the east and set in the west, but Eisenhower's dream of a legislative relocation facility was dead. Its notoriety made it completely useless. Congress's doomsday bunker was declassified and closed on November of 1995. You might ask what happened, what happened between 19, the 1992 Bunker Disclosure article in 1995. Well, that's a story for another day and an entertaining one also. The media spin at the time was the whole bunker thing was a silly, though historically interesting relic of the Cold War. I would beg to differ. I believe the Greenbrier Bunker is a monument to a few men who believed that fear of an unimaginable terror demanded that patriots come together and consider the unconsiderable and achieve the impossible. And they did for almost 40 years. Pretty darn good, I'd say. Thank you very much. We have about six minutes, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Is there a crime I didn't believe? Uh, yes. Um, back to that uh, uh, meeting in my office with Ted Gupp. He had pressed me that, um, that he knew more about the bunker than I could ever imagine. He then said, I know the code name of the bunker. My response was, um, that's fascinating. Um, if, yeah, why don't we continue your fantasy and tell me what you think this code name thing is. And he said, it's Project Casper. Now, you remember earlier I said that it, the project name changed from time to time? That's operational security. So in the total uh, 38 years of the project, um, only uh, a little over 900 people were ever cleared at the top secret level. Top secret level mean you knew the code name of the project, the current code name. You knew the operating plan for the project. You knew who the client was, the House and the Senate. 
and um, uh, and you were privy to the unrecorded and classified leads. Um, so he had covered, he also said that he knew that it was for the House and Senate. So he had two of four compartments of the top, uh, of the top secret compartment covered. And then he said, actually, he knows you, Ted. And I said, you know, I got gender too at that point. And, um, and I said, well, have him call me. And um, now we have the ability to do a whole lot of things at the Green Bar. You wouldn't want this to happen in most hotels, certainly not in, in Chris Lavin's or uh, Jay Wendell's, but um, we could trace anyone's call and know where they're going and who they were talking to and what they were talking about. It's part of what we did that, in those days. Um, <clears throat> so I immediately notified uh, our communications people in the bunker that we needed to be on alert and jump on Mr. Gupp's line. Lo and behold, immediately when he gets to his room, he calls a number in Boca Raton, Florida, and talks to a person, and we know who it is immediately, who was the original head cryptographer on the unit in 1962 when it opened. Um, now, uh, when you disclose uh, classified information at this level, it's considered prima facie evidence of, um, of, uh, of harm to national security and punishable by, uh, uh, and subject to treason. Um, he got off uh, fairly light. Um, I don't know why. That wouldn't have been my choice. Um, but he was a traitor, as far as I was concerned. Uh, when I saw the entire House and Senate on September 12, 2001, on the steps of the Capitol, I knew the answer to another question that I had is, um, where are they gonna go from now on? That's when I knew they had nowhere to go. That we were it. And how do you, how do you hide it in plain sight anymore? You can't. It just, uh, there's too many eyes in the sky that follow everything. Thanks, Cliff. Other questions? Dan. That was uh, Gupp's opening question. And these things are practice responses, you know. So we knew all the things to, to, uh, to parry the, the swords that are coming at you. And I said, um, oh, yeah, we have three golf courses. We probably have 200 bunkers. Which one did you want to talk about? <laughs> and uh, he was a humorless person. And he said, no, no, no. Uh, I want to talk about the one bunker, the one underneath the West Virginia wing, and I'm going, oh boy. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, so what are you required to do? In the article, I um, appear as a somewhat less than believable liar, uh, but I was doing my duty as I was instructed, and um, he even threatened me. He came to our house, Karen might even remember this, just because he stayed three days at the hotel. And he said, um, Ted, I'm going to give you one last chance uh, because I am going to write this article and the title to the article I already have, it's going to be The Last Resort. I can make you look like a hero or I can make you look like a total jerk. Which do you want to be? And I looked right at him and said, uh, if you're expecting me to tell you some crazy story about some bunker that's hidden here, I guess I'll have to be the jerk. And yeah, I don't think I come off as a jerk, but maybe as an unbelievable liar. And uh, that was part of the deal. Other questions? Yes. So the demise premises are still right there. Um, it was a long negotiation. I mentioned that's a longer story. Um, but when it was built by the government, they paid for it. They also paid for the new wing of the hotel. Think about that for a while. Um, then they deeded the whole thing to uh, the White Sulphur Springs Company, which was the, um, the legal entity of, of the Greenbrier. 
And then they leased it back from us, executed an unrecorded and classified lease that had no duration. Um, and that was one interesting time dealing with people in Washington, they were highly reluctant. Remember this is 1992 and Tom Foley is a speaker of the house. Uh, Tom Foley doesn't want any part of, part of this. And um, he uh, was more concerned about remaining as Speaker of the House. He probably should have been concerned about holding his seat in Congress because the next year he'd be, he would be, or the, two years later, he would be voted out of his seat. Forget being Speaker anymore. Um, his wife was the, uh, his um, chief of staff and that was an interesting um, way to deal with things. Uh, George Mitchell on the other side of the Capitol and his staff were much easier to be dealt with. We finally came to an agreement and, um, and we then decided what the hell do we do with this? And I had been researching the use of Iron Mountain for document and data storage and Stratton, you'll like this part. Um, you know, so uh, you can absolutely control heat, um, humidity, everything within this facility. Remember, it's sealed and there's nine feet of reinforced concrete and steel above, below, and all around. And um, one thing that's very delicate is old uh, celluloid film. And we struck a deal with a company I'm not supposed to acknowledge, probably figure it out, uh, to take uh, uh, 100,000 square feet of the facility for document and data storage. And we set up a separate company to handle that called CSX Intellectual Property, IP. And, um, and that was enough to cover the costs of maintaining this um, millstone we found around our neck at, uh, at a period in time that, um, does anyone remember the recession of 91 by any chance? So we were in the aftermath of that. It wasn't very much fun. And you know, so we were able to do that. Then we took the other 12,000 square feet and devoted it to a fairly good representation of the historical um, elements of the facility to allow school kids primarily to come through and really understand, you know, the, there's at least two generations that don't understand what the Cold War was. And to really allow them to understand what, is, what does it mean when they talk about the Cold War? And, and some of what I said today um, was part of uh, many presentations I made to the kids coming through. Uh, very gratifying, actually. Thank you very much. Great to be with you today.